Hey, I'm Lou Brutus, and one of my favorite human beings and an incredible musician joins me now, Mark Tremonti, who is here to speak about new Alter Bridge and many other things. Mark, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Glad to be back on with you. Now, what T-shirt are you wearing? Because you asked about mine. I'm wearing the factory. It's, um, gosh, where is that? It's whenever I go on tour, I ask my tour manager, please get me one of the venue T-shirts. And I, they tell them, you know what, the band will wear them on stage and promote the club. So I love getting uh, local venue shirts. I don't know where the factory is from, to be honest with you. Huh. Well, I'm wearing one. You, you said, oh, it looks like it's a death metal band, but it's actually Venus the <laughs> Meowing Pussycat. And, and that, that is one of my neighbor's cats. And uh, we call her that because she follows us around and meows at my dog, Darla. Um, so, uh -huh. so, you know, my, my neighbors consider me rather eccentric because I do T-shirts for the cats and dogs. But, but your neighbors do the same thing, too. You're sort of a, 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 the odd duck in your neighborhood, right? I'm definitely the odd duck. I'm the, uh, I'm the guy. I'm the, well, I took my earrings out now, but I'm definitely the, uh, the non- I don't fit in. I don't fit in with everybody, you know, so it's, I don't fit on on tour either. I'm only a guy without tattoos on tour with, you know, I look, I, I'm somewhere in between. So I don't fit anywhere in this world. <laughs> you know what? I, I, and, and I, I always sort of poke fun at myself for this. I have no ink. I have no piercings. And I love pointing out that when I was a kid, if you were a guy covered in ink and piercings, you were an outlaw. Now, if you don't have ink and piercings, you are the standout. Now it took it took right. me forty plus years, but now I am the outlaw. Now I am the outsider. You know that's right. Now it's not the time for us to decide to get a tattoo. <laughs> nah, you know. Also, I never saw any artwork that I thought was so great that yes, I want that on my skin for the rest of my life. You know, yeah. not not even not even Van Gogh. I looked around and I found some stuff. But whenever I'd find something, I um, like I did this guitar. Uh, Joe Fenton was the artist. I found some art by him when I was looking up tattoo art. I'm like, you know what? I'll just get it painted on my guitar instead of my arm. <laughs> How many guitars do you have, by the way? You've got to have a, a, a slew of them. Geez, I'm not sure. At home, um, I probably have about 20 at home, but at, at the storage, I have uh, easily another 20 in storage, 20, 30. Oh, actually, I, I thought you were going to talk hundreds because, you know, no. there's guys like Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick, and I, I don't even think he knows how many he has. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, John Five has some incredible horror themed guitars, and I, he's got to have 50, 100, 100 plus, you know? See, I'm an amp guy. My my amp collection is pretty extensive. You see, it's all it's all uh, wrapped around me. And if you go, I'll, I'll take you on the quick and brief little, This is this is my room of doom in here. I like that room of doom. You know, this is just so as you can Holy see. I'm, geez. A, I'm an amp, I'm an amp fanatic. So it's uh that's where it happens in there. Which by uh, the way is is an excellent bridge into the new altar bridge. Tell me about any vintage stuff. We'll start with amplifiers that you use for particular songs, particular solos or anything, because I know you get very, very picky about the different yeah. tones and sounds that you get. The funniest thing is I um, I bought a uh, Dumble amplifier a while back. The one I used to kind of dial in my signature MT100 that's coming out hopefully next year. But uh, anyways, I get this amp. It's world class, one of the best sounding amps I've ever owned in my life. And um, I didn't end up using it, but Miles did. <laughs> so Miles, all the leads that Miles did were on my Dumble. Um, and I used my signature. I used the MT100 mixed with the MT15 mixed with the cornford rk100 and um uh, i can't i can't remember what else but we always i always go in there bring in a stack a pile of amps and then we kind of shoot them out and then i take everything home and we leave a, end up using about four or five of them who who loads and unloads the car with all that stuff because that ain't fun oh you know what i i get it in the car with my son my oldest son's 17 now so he can get those you know cabinets and whatnot in the car and then when i leave the studio josh elvis is uh assistant tech who will help me get them out yeah see he's good having a 17 year old when it comes time to move oh, yeah. dad's amps that's right that's right no dad i don't want to you're gonna you're gonna do it whether you like it or not back when i was your age you know those were tube amps we had to move you know what those things weighed these amps put a roof over your head son that's right those amps, those amps bought that pool kid that's now right. move it that's right um 
you know, Elvis Basquette, you, you know, you guys worked with again, of course, is, is he sort of a vintage gear kind of guy at all? You know, he had one of the coolest boards. Um, I think it was like one of less than 10, I think were made. I think one of them was in that Foo Fighters documentary. Um, I forget what it was called, but they had the special big Neve console that they used. Elvis has had one of those and he sold it recently to up to, he likes the board he has now better. I think, I think it was a wonder audio did a Neve style desk, which, um, so if you listen to the tones on this record, um, different from the last record, you can kind of hear a little bit. If you're, if only if you're a, a sound genius, can you really hear the difference between those boards? You know, there's, there's only a few of us that can really dig in and I'm not one of them that can dig in and really hear that difference. <laughs> But uh, it, I think it sounds awesome. It's much more high tech, much more like you're in the you're in the Starship Enterprise looking at it. You know, the old school board was just that old school thing. This one's very animated and it's it's cool, automated. You know, I, I would have to think that a top flight board like that, you got to be talking like at least mid six figures. Those things are expensive, really expensive. They're um, you know, but if you're if you're a producer, it's like. Um, you know, it's like buying your office, you know, it's buying an office space. It's, it's, it's expensive, but I think after, what is it? Three years is a good business plan. If you can get your money back in three years, it's a good investment for a future business. And I think they, they should be able to do that. So let's talk about pawns and Kings. Tell me about how it came about, how it got done. Tell me everything you can remember. Yeah. So, um, we had, you know, the, the looming date about, um, I don't know, about a year ago. And me and Miles were both telling our manager, Tim, like, no, this is too, this is too soon. We, we can't do it. You know, it's uh, so that's good for me and Miles, because when me and Miles fear, uh, uh, you know, a looming deadline, we work hard. So we uh, it turned into <laughs> us saying us no into us both um, outpaced, trying to outpace one another, turning in songs uh, demo in demo form for the new record. So, you know, Tim would laugh. He'd like you. You turn in two songs, and Miles would turn in two songs, and you turn in three songs, and he'd turn in three songs, and it was like a kind of a race to the finish. Um, and uh, once we got into the studio, um, I think we took about two weeks to get together. And it's very important this, this band to to play together and, and have these demos played in person because it's it's one thing hearing something on a, on a demo. When you get the whole band behind it, they change and they you put that alter bridge spin on it. Um, you know, the, the rhythm section changes things tremendously. We look at all the, you know, when we do demos, the transitions are just simple. They're, they're, not, they're not worked out the way they need to be. Um, it's, it's, man, I'm getting spammed left and right these days by politicians. I just got, a, I just got hit up again. But, um, but anyways, we, uh, we get in there, we put the ultra bridge spin on it. We make sure that it's, um, the transitions are nice and smooth. Every part speaks to us. Uh, about one and a half songs to two songs a day we'd get through in pre-production. And um, I think about three days into it was when we all kind of were started getting excited about this record, Elvis, especially. He's like, you know, this reminds me of the Fortress album. Um, he was all fired up. And when your producer feels like that, it helps get the best out of you as a, as a band. From what I've heard of it so far, the the word, and I don't know if this is a, a fair approximation, but grand, it's a very grand, big sounding record in terms of instrumentation, lengths of some of the songs. Did it just work out that way? Or did you guys get together beforehand and say, hey, maybe we should try this or that? You know, it's, the funny thing is, is, is about um, when we put out the last record, I had called I think Miles and Tim and said, you know, it'd be cool is to do a record that was all the big, you know, each song is this, this big, huge story, you know, put a bunch of big songs together, not, not just, not for the sake of them being long, but really instead of doing a 15 song record, do an eight song record and make these all like, you know, big, big lengthy songs that, that made sense. Um, we decided to not do that, but I guess the, the, I don't know if the seed was planted or not, but it ended up being a, a record full of some of our longest songs. I think the, our very longest song of all time is on this record. Um, but I think we had only one or two songs under four minutes on this record. So they're all, um, you know, pretty, pretty in depth. And when you're in pre-production going over a record like that, it hurts your brain a lot because you're, you know, a lot of times if you're not familiar with a song, you have to remember something that's six and a half minutes long and play it in real time. 
it uh, it's like doing it's 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 doing homework in your brain for sure. You know, I wonder if you guys will get these songs out on stage and like, you know, five and a half, six minutes into a tune, look at each other like, what were we thinking? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny you say that, you know, when when we're young, when you're young in your rock and roll career, you write records just for songs you want to hear when you play the record. You start slowly shifting it to that plus what's going to be fun to play night after night after night. You know, um, there's been so many songs that, that we've written over the years. Um, you know, like off the first record, a song like Shed My Skin. I love listening to that song, but playing it live is not, it's, the energy just doesn't, you know, it's not something that's like, we can't, we got to play that song. So it's, um, you know, slowly but surely, the more you, you tour, the more you want to write records that are exciting to play. And this, this record's stock full of songs that are just high energy and, and uh, good challenge. And they're going to be fun, fun live. You know, the first song uh, most people have got to hear is Silver Tongue. If you can give me any background on it. The, the first thing that I thought of when I saw the song title before I even heard it, uh, and I haven't quite cracked the lyrics yet, so I, I, I doubt there's a connection, but I'll, I'll mention it. There uh, is a great film called Ink Heart with mm -hmm. Brendan Fraser, and uh, in it are, are um, characters called Silver Tongues. Uh, hmm. Again, I'm just bringing that up for the nerds. I don't think there's a connection, yeah. but but I I thought it worth mentioning. No, I think it's uh, the silver tongue is more. Uh, I, I would I, I would definitely uh, defer to Miles on that. Yeah. That's uh, that's one of the ideas. Like I said, when we turned into demos for these records, um, we're we're pretty. Um, you know, we take one of mine, one of his, one of mine, one of his. And silver tongue was one of the first ideas that Miles had turned in, but it was in. Uh, it was just a few parts. I think it was just the A and B parts. And um, that was the first riff that I heard that Miles had turned in for this record. So I immediately went to my laptop, broke out all my ideas and started just sending Miles idea after idea to go with it. And um, that's kind of how we've done. If we were in person in the same city, that's how we would do things. I would play him my favorite idea and he would put his ideas with him. So with Silver Tongue, I, I started throwing bridge ideas and riff ideas at him and, and um, you know, he loved them. He loved them all. And we just went with it. So it's, um, you know, the, the tough, one of the toughest things for us to do is pick a first single. Um, it's always, we always have the problem of there's never that one song that's just like, all right, this is by far the obvious choice. I wish that would happen. But um, I think on this record, we turned in four songs to ask um, our domestic and international radio folks, what do you think? And uh, this one got the most votes. So we went with it. Is it as much fun doing things remotely like that as opposed to getting in a, uh, a room someplace and banging it out? Well, we do get in a room for two weeks, you know, as a band. But, um, you know, I think on the next record, I already, I already talked to um, my manager about this. I said, you know, it'd be good just to go to Montana or something for a month, just sit in a cabin, nothing else to do but hang out and, and, and play and um and just kind of see what happens. I think with each record, it's good to do something different. Um, like I remember when we did um, the Blackbird record, we had all the time in the world because we didn't have a record label. We didn't have management. We were kind of just floating in the wind. So we were fighting for survival, writing nonstop. Um, and then there's other records where you have um, this last minute writing thing where it's capturing lightning in a bottle, which when it works, it's great. When it doesn't work, it's stressful. So it's kind of... Um, you know, it's good to challenge yourself in different ways along the way. So you don't just keep sounding like you're putting out the same album. How, how hot does the fire get underneath you when you're on a deadline and you're not getting ideas? I mean, that's, that's really got to be a, a special kind of suckage for an artist. Yeah, it's not, it's not fun. You know, there's, you know, as a, as a songwriter, you could go a week or two just like, ah, I'm not inspired. I'm not doing anything. I'm not writing anything good. And then you could have that one day where you have a dozen ideas come out. And I kind of have this rule. If I'm having one of those days, I don't care if it's six o'clock in the morning, don't stop. Just keep going. I don't care if you have to go 48 hours straight. If that is coming out of you, just keep it going until you can't stand anymore. You know, cause you don't know you can't time those, those times of, of inspiration. You know, it's why the good Lord gave us caffeine. Yeah. Caffeine would kill me. I, I, I can't do caffeine. Really? <laughs> I'll make my heart explode. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah too bad. I, loud rock and roll and caffeine is the way I go, but I, I can't overdo it. The wife makes coffee that's essentially like 
they could replace methamphetamine with this coffee, oh, you know, it's yeah. just like, gig, 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 gig. but oh, you know, if you need to stay up and, and keep things going, it's the, oh, uh, yeah. it's the way to go. So oh, yeah. now what's, what's the timetable for everything uh, and, and include touring in the U S with that, which I, I think is going to have to wait a little bit. So we released the album on October 14th and then the tour starts November 1st in Europe goes through December 12th. Um, cool thing is, is we end the tour in London and then I have two days off and then I do Sinatra in London. So um, in London, we do the O2 arena, which is this great big arena in London. And then the O2 arena has a theater attached to it. And I'm just right in that theater with Sinatra. So it's a perfect scenario. Has and anyone that, ever, has ever, anyone ever done that? Like doubled up the, it, because I've been to the O2 arena. I was there mm -hmm. for the Led Zeppelin reunion. They're mm -hmm. an up and coming band. They were very good. Oh, yeah. We I, hear, I think I've heard I hear about them. Yeah. <laughs> but right. I, I have not been to that theater, but I know the, the whole complex is just gorgeous. Has anybody ever done them back to back like that? I'm not sure. I'm excited to do it though. I, I think I've only been in that room once. I think it was like a, um, it was an award show. Um, back in the day um mm. but it's uh it's great i can't wait to do it because when i did the first sinatra show it was in a small theater you know it's about 500 people um so this is this is going to be i think it's like between 2500 and 3000 people so it'll be a way different thing and um i'm adding all kinds of new songs to the set that that aren't from the record because it's you know there were so many i wanted to put on this record that i couldn't do so i'm just going to keep doing it live so is the band ready to go or are you going to walk off stage with Alter Bridge and go right in rehearsals for two days before this gig? We have to rehearse day of show. That's the huge difference between the rock and roll world and the big band world. When you have a 17 piece band, um, you don't get to just hang out for a couple of days and rehearse. These guys get their sheet music. They put it in front of them. They play it exactly the way they're supposed to play it. I have my guys. Um, one of a cool story is when I'm doing the Sinatra thing, Mike Smith, who's the band leader, um, he told me, he's like, at the end of the show, you know, thank the local guys and then thank your guys. Your guys will be wearing black shirts. The local guys will be wearing white shirts. So whenever Frank Sinatra toured around the world, he could always look back and see his guys in his black shirts. He's like, we are now your guys. So I'm like, you're my guys. This is, you know, it was one of those kind of like join in the club moments when I got the you know, Frank Sinatra's guy saying we're, we're with you now, you know, which was quite an honor. Well, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm dying to see you do this. Tell me about, you know, if, if I can't hop a plane to make it there right before Christmas this year, when can I see you doing the Sinatra thing? So we're going to go over there and do the 15th um, in, in London. And then I'm going to come home for the holidays. And then after Christmas, uh, we're going to do a couple of shows in Florida. So one of them, um hopefully is here in orlando and then the other one we just have to choose i think they i think we had offers to do four or five shows in florida but we want to we want to keep it make it special and just maybe just do two between christmas and new year's here in florida so uh we're still going to pick where it's at hopefully one's in orlando and other one could be fort lauderdale or miami or who knows i would really love to see that and and you and i have spoken on many occasions through the years uh, about your love for Sinatra, um, my love for Sinatra. Uh, and again, I don't think you ever got to see him live, did you? No, I did not. I did not. I wasn't wise enough back in before 98 to go out and see that. Well, you know what? It's it's funny that you put it like that. I'm going to repeat something I've told you before, but um, I saw Sinatra three times, mm -hmm. twice thanks to my friend Liz, who was on his lighting crew at the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City. And I got to go to two invitation-only shows. Uh, one of which was Frank, the other was Frank and Liza Minnelli. And yes. I saw him a third time at the Spectrum in Philadelphia with Stephen Eady opening. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my rocker friends, particularly like my my metal friends and my punk friends were like, oh, what do you want to go see Sinatra for? And I'm like, because he's Frank Sinatra, like you're out of your, you, got, you guys are crazy. Oh, yeah. Not going to see him when you could. And and before we uh, we, uh, you know, you and I got online to do this. I went into my memorabilia cases and I pulled a couple of things out. Now the golden nugget, I have no real souvenirs from because mm -hmm. I, I literally, I wasn't allowed to have a ticket. I was, I was in the lighting booth with the lighting crew watching from up there and it was just terribly exciting. But here is my 
one Frank Sinatra ticket stub. I don't know wow. how that's going to show up, and I don't know if it's backwards, that's, but that's awesome. So that's from the Spectrum oh, in Philadelphia. That's incredible. I'm and glad he, you kept that. That's incredible. Well, I keep everything. You know, I'm I'm working on another book. I want to do a book of all of my memorabilia, the three thousand plus shows, and all the tickets and backstage passes and set lists and everything. All right, what do you got? What do you got? What are you pulling out all here? Right, let me show you. So, my good friend uh, Chuck Bruckman gave me this. So Sinatra Caesar's Palace, and it's got you know like the um, oh, got like a menu and. You know the whole program here was that on the tables that was uh, that was on the tables inside the, the i'm uh, sure you know this is the venue it's, yeah. um yeah it just has this dinner served you know that's that was a show tony bennett on the back you know it's uh crazy and i don't know if i showed you this but this is one of my prized possessions so frank sinatra was a painter and he um did, was this from the auction I told you about? Yes, it was. Oh, you You're bought it. Oh, man. It. Yes. Oh, you but got it and then yes. won it. Oh, it's I, and I won it. Let me see. Yes. Oh, you got it. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm assuming he painted that in Palm Springs, right? He painted these. I don't know where he um, he did them later in life. I don't, I don't know where it was, but he yeah. did a bunch of these. Like if you look up Frank Sinatra painting online, you'll see a lot of these clowns and they're all very, they're all a little bit different if you really look at them. And, and they're all very expensive. <laughs> you know what? It, this one, um, there was two for sale and, and during that auction and I was fighting for this one. The other one was huge. Um, the other one was like a, you know, a, a, a much bigger one, but very simple, just almost like a children's quick little five minute painting right yeah that one went that one went for fifty thousand, like crazy amount of money this this one cost me as much as a guitar amplifier you know it's it was it was very i, I got a i got really lucky on this one because it was small you know but yeah. I, I actually would have preferred this one than that other one yeah and and that i mean you you've got to frame that and do i mean you can't oh, yeah. You know, that, that's the thing with all of this stuff. I've got like a thousand plus posters covered in signature. Mm -hmm. Like I've got tons of stuff and, and yet it's all in storage. Nobody's enjoying it. You know, oh, I'm putting I, this up for sure. Now, do you keep all your own stuff? Do you keep all the passes and set lit? Do you keep all that stuff? I keep all the passes. I have a big ring, a bunch of ring things with them. Um, I have, uh, I have drawers where I have, um, I have a drawer with all the best stuff in it, like the um, the the biggest best magazine covers and the um, like the key to Las Vegas when the mayor gave it to us and the, um, you know like the original sketches of things like all the all the old school great you know the the, the most memorable stuff and then um, I've got a drawer of stuff that's just that fan made stuff like um, like I get a kick out of like people will give you like a, a little bobblehead of yourself, you know, and my kids love it. So I'll, I'll keep those um, paintings, you know, a lot of cool band paintings. And um, of course, you know, all the other magazines and whatnot. I try to keep everything that's that's important because one day, like I said, I don't really look at it too much. But one day I want to sit down with my grandkids. Go, you know what your grandpa did? <laughs> 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 you know i was moving those tube amps on my own that's before right, you all were right. born you know what's an amp what's an amp grandpa uh, that's right yeah oh that's great stuff and again you know I, i'll encourage you the the way i i've encouraged some other artist friends who have had you know long storied careers like your own there's got to be a book one day i mean if i've got enough stuff for a book then by God, you've got enough for like uh, a nice coffee table book or something, you know, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd buy five of them, you know? Nice. Well, you never know. I, I'll have to, I'll have to live a little bit more life before that happens. And I want to write my fictional book first. What can, can I ask what it's about? Well, I wrote the dying machine novel, um, yeah. but I, uh, we printed up, I don't know how many copies of it sold them out. And then, um, people advise me if you want to get a publishing deal you got to stop selling them so you can get that deal oh oh, oh i see so they, they, oh, okay i thought you were talking about something new and no so i've well i've written a new story that i have i've i've planned a new story but one of the toughest things in in my um uh creative career if you want to call it that was getting this publishing deal i've been up and down and left and right and gone through every i've done everything to try to make this thing happen and getting a publishing deal is 
<laughs> seems way harder than getting a record deal. So it, um, it, yeah, and and I've to, I've told people this, you know, after my memoir came out a couple of years ago, uh, folks were like, "Oh man, you know, how do I get a book deal?" And I'm like, "Man, you're 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 like." just forget it. <laughs> it's like yeah. you think the record industry is screwed up the publishing world is really really yeah. tough because not a lot of people buy books anymore i i love buying actual books but a lot of people just buy the kindle versions or whatever it is and just download it online but um so that's that's one of my missions i'm, I'm actively trying to get that that book deal so i can i can uh get these books out again well, I can't wait. Well, one last thing. Um, and, and again, because I'm a degenerate collector of stuff, mm -hmm. um, custom guitar picks. Do you remember what the circumstances were of your first uh, of your first custom guitar pick? Because th that's actually like a pretty big deal for most guitar players to finally get their own. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember. Um, gosh, it was it was a one millimeter nylon Jim Dunlop pick and it said Creed on it. And it was the it was the tour. I forget which tour it was. It might've been human clay or something, but it was a uh, nylon pick. It wasn't just written on. It was actually the raised lettering. So it was all black with the raised lettering and the, um, you know, the logo. And then my signature on the one side raised. Um, so it was super cool. And I had a bag of, I don't know, 10,000 of them when they sent them. I mean, it's just like a garbage. You don't have any left now, do you? And I, gave i gave most of them away because I, I just would never get get to them um so it's funny i used those picks for so many years i i just thought that's just my pick and then i realized i don't know four years ago let me try some other picks and i'm so glad i did i changed the pick. I, you still use a dunlop but it's a different style and it changed you know it changes things dramatically that's awesome. Uh, and do you, are you a collector of other people's picks? Some guitarists aren't. And, uh, and no, aren't not really. You know, I've, I've gotten a lot of cool ones over the years, um, you know, and I'll keep I'll keep the real special ones. But um, I never go. I my thing, I'd like to get a picture with somebody. If I see somebody, I want to just capture that moment, get a picture with them. T tell me, name a couple of names of folks that you were like, geez i gotta get a picture with this guy or girl and and then a couple of more that you'd still like to get done so two of the coolest i've ever gotten were um robert plant which was incredible jimmy page and they were separate two different two different circumstances i got a picture with sting which was pretty great um recently i got a picture with king diamond who's you know we're more friendly you know but i oh. I, you know, growing up, I was a huge King Diamond fan. So yeah. it's always great to, to, to run into him. I've gotten multiple pictures with Eddie Van Halen, which is just always blows my mind. You know, that's, that's always incredible. Um, you know, just meeting, you know, just slash, you know, I ran into slash a bunch of times getting shots with him is great. Um, you know, I, I don't think I ever got a picture with, with the Metallica guys. I'd like to do that. I've met them so many times, but um, yeah, no, it's, I'm still I'm still like a kid in, in high school when I when I see these guys. See, and I, I think, man, you just got to the root of what I think is one of the most important things, um, particularly in, in the entertainment business. But I, I, I think it goes for any portion of life. You, you still have to retain an excitement for what you're doing. Um, <laughs> you know, not that you want to get starstruck or anything when you meet somebody, but if you lose that sense of being a fan and why you got into this in the first place, I think that's a, a major sign of, of burnout and a major sign of, you know, losing a creative edge. You've still, you still got to get excited by this stuff or else you're, you're kind of dead inside. I think anyway. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you don't, if you're not excited about it, you're going to start putting out subpar stuff. You're just not going to be as good as your, your past stuff. You've got to, yeah. I mean, it's, um, I've met a lot of different types of musicians over the years, and you can tell the guys that are hungry when you meet them, the guys that are working all the time, the guys that are um, working on their, their writing, songwriting and their playing instead of partying all the time. You know, it's great to party. It's great to have fun. I, I do as much as anybody else, but not as much as a lot of guys I've seen out there that kind of come and go. You know, I, the guys that stick around are the guys that work really hard. Yeah. And the guys who stick around uh, are often the ones who sometime, I think it's usually late twenties, early thirties. It's like, 
I don't think I can drink a bottle of Jack Daniels every night anymore. You know, like there comes a point where your body will just not allow you to do that. You know, there were, there were some people who had iron constitutions. Lemmy was one, you know, he just kept going until the very end, but he was the exception to that rule. You know, you, you eventually either got to grow up and wean yourself away from that, or you're just going to either burn yourself out and or die. So, yeah. Oh yeah. With, with Alter Bridge, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, if, if I want to have a drink, it's going to be with Scott Phillips. You know, he's always a good time. Miles, Miles is very tame. Brian's sober now for years and years and years. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a um, you know, just, it's just straightforward to have, you know, hanging out. There's not a ton of partying on, on an Alter Bridge tour. Yeah. Uh, so it's. Well, uh, everybody's got families now, you know, you don't yeah. want to be calling back to the wife drunk. Hey, baby, no. I love you. <laughs> I'm in the bunk. I love you. You know, so. <laughs> Well, on oh, that yeah. happy note, uh, Mark, it's always great to speak to you. And I, I could sit and talk music geekery with you for hours oh, yeah. and hours. But uh, congratulations on the new record. Can't Thank wait you. to see Alter Bridge. And man, you know, I, you let me know those dates down in Florida for the Sinatra. Oh, yeah. Family. You know, it's, Absolutely. It's, it's not that bad of a flight from here. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's come on down. Let's, let's get together. 